Well, good day and welcome to Fizz, Fun Interactive Sunday School. I'm glad you joined us today and I hope that you're going to be able to attend worship in person. But in case you can't, we're glad that there's an alternative that you can tune in and get a Sunday School lesson. Stop and start the video anytime that you want and just be able to apply God's Word to your life. And that's what Fizz is all about. Love to see your pictures of what you're doing during this time of shutdown and <laughs> shut in and uh, strange happenings. Uh, and uh, so if you have a picture of your family and uh, some of the activities that you've had to revert to, uh, certainly we'd love to see those. If you have a comment about any of the lessons that we've had, love to see those comments as well. I uh, hope you enjoy the cartoons that are going in and out of this uh, particular video series and uh, hope that you can still keep a smile on your face and a little laughter in your heart in order to uh, enjoy all that God's created for us. We're in the book of Isaiah. It's the second longest of the major prophets. And again, a major prophet is just one that wrote more than any of the other prophets. Uh, there's 37,407 words in the book of Isaiah, 66 chapters. That's just about twice as large as the Gospel of John, uh, both in years and in words. And uh, so we cover 66 uh, chapters, uh, 66 years, uh, excuse me, 60 years uh, in Isaiah, and uh, 33 years in, of course, the Gospel of John, 21 chapters. So it's a significant book. As a matter of fact, several people have written that uh, the Bible contains one quarter uh, of its content in prophecy. And therefore, we do, do a disservice to God giving us this wonderful book uh, by not studying uh, the prophets that are covered in the scriptures. Some have said they're out of date, but I would uh, hearken to quickly tell you that if you take a look at the review of the applications that we've had for this series on Isaiah, you'll find that we would miss some real blessings of application uh, and some real credibility to our belief in the scriptures being true and accurate in every way if we didn't study the prophets. And so I hope that you would take some time to go beyond this Sunday School lesson and read all of Isaiah read all of the prophets, and uh, slowly do that so that you can apply them to your lives. Now, Isaiah is an interesting book because it not only makes a short-term prophecy, that is, it's a pre-exile prophet, uh, that means that he prophesied almost a hundred years before uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem, and very accurately predicted what was going to happen just a hundred years in the future. But he also, especially as we get into these last chapters, uh, we get into the fact that he saw the Messiah, he saw the birth, and he saw the second coming of the Messiah. So saw out way more than a hundred years with incredible accuracy. And it brings great uh, credibility to our study of the scriptures. Uh, chapters one through 35, prophetic, 36 through 39, historical and transitional, and chapters 40, which is where we are now, through 66, messianic. Uh, incredible study that we're going to do, but first let's take a look at a review of the uh, studies that we've already had and see what wonderful applications we can get uh, from the book of Isaiah. Let's review. God confronts. Come, let us reason together. Unit two, God sends, here am I, send me. Unit three, God promises, not believe, surely not stand. God reigns, if he is Lord of all the nations. God saves, he will destroy death forever. God protects, he is the Lord of all armies. God listens, he hears prayers. God renews is today's lesson. Trust in him and he will renew your strength. That's seven wonderful applications to our lives. 
from just seven units in the book of Isaiah. Imagine what you'd miss if you hadn't seen the words of Isaiah and been able to apply them, not just to history, but to your life. And those are wonderful lessons. You may want to go back and look at that again and realize those little phrases, paraphrases that I made for each of the units uh, to remember what a wonderful application the book of Isaiah can be for your life. Let's take a look at again today, uh, those quick charts. You can stop and start. I'm only going to leave them up for a few seconds, but uh, understanding where Isaiah fits into the Bible and also understanding how prophets saw short-term and, and long-term because they saw very often just mountaintops. So let's just take a quick review of those two charts. Uh, I'll leave them up only for a couple of seconds, but you can stop and start so you can study those charts. Now remember the prophet spoke about an 800 year period of time and it's very interesting when you look at the chart one and two of those uh, times and of which prophets overlapped the others. Also you need to read 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles in order to understand all of the historical events that are going on. Today's lesson God renews is a wonderful lesson because we all need renewal. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more renewal I need. Uh, it's wonderful what medical science has done. Uh, I wore my hips out and I had to have my hips replaced. Uh, I wore my knees out and they need to be replaced, but I'm not going to do that. I wore my eyes out and uh, they were able to do some cataract surgery and some renewal of the retina on the back of my right eye. It's, renewal is a wonderful thing. Sometimes they're not quite as dramatic as my hips or my knees or my eyes. Sometimes it's just plain getting some rest after putting in really hard week or really hard month or really hard year. And certainly all of us are going to be glad when 2020 is over. Uh, there are good treatments for the virus and there is a vaccine so that we don't have to worry about so many people dying of the uh, terrible, terrible COVID virus. Nevertheless, uh, renewal is a wonderful thing, and I think all of us can relate to the fact that it's a good thing when we can be renewed. I, I'll go back to the time that I had my hip surgery, my first hip, and uh, recognize that I was in so much pain that I told the doctor, either shoot me or fix me. And he said, I can fix you, but I'm not allowed to shoot you. And after he did the surgery, there was a renewal time. Uh, you see, he cut muscles and tendons uh, in order to be able to do the surgery to replace that entire hip joint. And that meant weeks of physical therapy, renewing the muscles and the ligaments, renewing the strength that I had. And having been in bed for a number of days, uh, there was a renewal in getting out of the bed and getting around and walking. And I remember they hurried that process up. Uh, day after surgery, they wanted you up. They didn't want you putting a lot of weight on that. Uh, hip, but they did want you up and around because they knew your lungs needed renewing. They knew that you needed your blood circulation going. And I remember giving myself shots because uh, they didn't want blood clots to occur. There was a renewing of my body during that time of recovery from my surgery. Renewing is a wonderful thing. Spiritual renewing is a wonderful thing. I look forward every week to hearing the pastors that I love and appreciate preach their messages on Sunday. It's a time of spiritual renewal for me. I love digging into God's Word daily so that I can do my thought for the day and put it on YouTube so that others can get a five to seven minute uh, spiritual renewal in their lives. So spiritual renewal is a wonderful thing. And God certainly talks about that today in Isaiah chapter 40. So let's take a look at that first verse, and let's talk about spiritual renewal. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare with him? During my lifetime, I've served uh, as a uh, layperson three different churches. As a minister, I've served six or seven different churches. And I can compare each of them to each other. I have seen and met and become friends with literally thousands of people in those nine to 12 churches that I've been involved in. And 
in each case I can compare the different people with each other. Uh, deacons, I can compare them with each other. Uh, members of the church, I can compare them with each other. Lois and I laugh sometimes because we uh, look at a name and we say, who is that? And I'll say, well, it's a, a little lady with gray hair. <laughs> you know how many little ladies with gray hair that we've known over the 12 churches <laughs> in the lifespan that we've had? Well, here this particular verse talks about comparisons. You can't compare God with a graven image made of wood or stone or precious metals. You, compa you can't compare God with uh, some politician. You can't compare God with some king or ruler. Uh, you can't compare God with the most benevolent benefactor that you possibly could run into. There's nobody like God. Nobody like God. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the one that spoke things into existence. He is the one that controls all events. He's the one that holds all of this universe into perfect sequence and perfect place. Now, how can you compare God with anything else? Uh, I, I have to ask you, uh, when you think about all of the different people you've met that question the existence of God, uh, one of the things they say is, what is God like? Uh, if, if he's an invisible power, uh, what is he like? Well, we don't know what God is like. Uh, we, we don't know uh, what appearance we might see when we see God. And yet that's not really true, is it? Because you see in the Gospel of John, it says in the beginning was God. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father. When we think about God, we can only think about Jesus. He's the only visualization that we have. And while we might not have lived during the time of Jesus, nevertheless, we can read the pages of his book. We can read the pages of his life. We can see the things that he did and the things that he didn't do. We can see his character, his nature. We can see his grace, his mercy, his love. We can see the emotions. We can see all of the things that are revealed to us through Scripture. Yet it's just a glimpse. It's just a glimpse of who God is. What is God like? Uh, is there anything at all that we could compare him with? The answer is clearly no. Even though he allowed us to see himself in the form of Jesus, it was just a short period of time, three years. And only a few of the events during those entire three years are revealed to us in Scripture. So when we read these words in Isaiah, what is God like? What can we compare him with? The answer is very clear. We can't compare him with anything. He's so far above and so much deeper. Uh, it's like diving in the ocean. Uh, I remember when I lived in the West Palm Beach area around Florida, and we could go down to the Keys uh, a few hundred miles down and go out into the ocean and uh, the floor of the ocean was maybe 18 to 30 feet around the living coral reef off of John Pennekamp State Park. And I can remember that we could dive all the way down, look at the beautiful coral and the beautiful fish. But I also remember going out into the Gulf Stream, uh, just three or four miles off of the West Palm Beach coast. There you could skin dive with an aqualung, and you dared not go down as far as the bottom would be because you would have terrible problems with decompression. The ocean was almost without belief in its depth. And there are places in the ocean where even the submersible devices that they have that take pictures for us, 
have the tendency and the danger of being crushed from the incredible forces of being down so deep. God is deeper. So what can we pair God with? There's nothing that we can pair God with. And that's certainly what Isaiah wanted us to think about when we look at this one verse. There's nothing that can compare with God. Think about it for a minute. Text, we also have to consider mankind. Uh, when you think about God, you have to think about his creation. His creation is mankind in this world. And we know already, as we've gone this far in the scriptures, the sin cycle that so often repeated itself. Man would do well, and he would prosper, and he would become self-sufficient and self-dependent and not recognize his need of God until he drifted further and further away from God and became lower and lower and became more entangled in muck and mire until he was absolutely at the lowest point and realized that his life was meaningless without God and that he had no future. And then he would cry out to God. He would say, oh, God, save me. Help me out of this muck and mire that I'm in. Give me meaning and purpose back in my life. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. And God in his mercy and kindness, his grace, would reach down and pull man out of the muck and mire, restore him, renew him, and give him a new opportunity. I, it was an incredible sin cycle that would go on because once man got back up on his feet, he'd start to drift away from God all over again. And once again, God would have to give him a chance for renewal. We see it with the nation of Israel. Israel will soon be overrun by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, by the Persians, by the Romans, and on and on it goes, just as it does today with wars and rumors of wars. And man, just as he did all through the Old Testament, is in a sin cycle, and when we become prosperous and we're doing well, we forget our need of God and we drift away from him. Well, we need to understand all of that as we look at Isaiah chapter 40. Because it's not only about who God is, it's about his renewal process. It's about how he renews. <laughs> now, I'm not a golfer, and I'm the first one to admit that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I usually say I get more than my money's worth because I usually get more strokes than anybody else. I get to swing at the ball more times than most of the other players. I usually see more of the golf course than most of the other players because I go from one set of woods to another set of woods to a sand trap to a water hazard and I see all of the golf course. I have a tendency to hit the ball just about any place and every place that it's not supposed to be. Uh, there's a term in golf that the uh, lesson writer used that I really like and it's called a mulligan. Uh, it's If you get up on uh, the, the green or the fairway or someplace and you uh, hit the ball wrong, uh, you pick the ball back up again and you don't count that stroke and you hit it again. It's a, another try, a renewal, uh, another opportunity. And God is a God of many opportunities. As a matter of fact, I want you to think for a minute, how many second chances has God given you? How many mistakes have you made that God allowed you to pick up your ball and hit it again? How many times has he allowed you a new start, a new beginning? You see, that's what this particular chapter of Isaiah is all about. It's about renewal. It's about new beginnings. It's about new starts. And so we need to take a look and see what Isaiah chapter 40 has for us to apply to our lives. Let's take a look at the next verses. As for the idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fashioned chains of silver. He who is impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skillful craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. 
well, we don't have too many idol makers these days, but most of you probably have lived long enough that you've been to either Disney World or Disneyland, and you've seen the incredible Hall of the Presidents, or, or perhaps you've been in It's a Small World or Pirates of the Caribbean, or one of the amazing things that the Disney people have created. Uh, they stand up, they speak, everything's synchronized beautifully. It's so far away from what we had ever experienced before and today's technology gets even greater and greater I mean look at the video that I'm making for you today with the transitions the fade-ins the fade-outs uh, the voiceovers and all of the different things that we can do with simple software uh, on a home computer and a camera no bigger than my thumb it's amazing isn't it and yet they're man-made objects and they really can't do anything for us. For example, if you went to the Hall of the Presidents and you went in and you sat down in front of JFK and asked him to tell you something that he wasn't programmed for, uh, he would just give you a blank stare. As a matter of fact, if you went over to shake his hand, you'd probably have to be careful because you might break and bend the mechanisms that makes him move. Well, certainly that's what Isaiah was saying here, but he had never seen Disney, so all he could do is go back to some of the things that have actually happened in biblical history. Idols made out of wood or made out of metal that fell over when they came in the presence of a living God. Uh, or to talk to you about how a piece of wood or piece of metal can't do anything for you. And it can't. As a matter of fact, I'm sorry, I have to laugh when I see those little plastic saints that are attached to somebody's dashboard, thinking to myself, oh, that little plastic piece isn't going to do anything for you except maybe hurt you even worse when you have an accident and that piece of plastic flies into your face. Well, we certainly need to understand that man-made objects can't do for us what God can do for us. And Isaiah certainly is trying to make that point. He's trying to make the point that there is no substitute for a living God, for a God that's all-powerful, all-knowing, and is everywhere. So when we think about God-made objects that we make, it may be a house, it may be a car, it may be a boat. It could even be a person that we have decided to marry. And we think that this is the God that's going to help us to find real happiness, find real fulfillment. And many times the houses and the boats and the cars and the mates do make life more pleasurable. But they're nothing like God. As a matter of fact, they say man's best friend is a dog. Recently I was out for a walk in the mountain and uh, we came across an Alaskan husky. Uh, a beautiful dog, silver and black gorgeous colorings. And, and as we got closer to it, it cowered down as if I was going to hit it or hurt it. And you had to start to wonder, has somebody abused this dog that he thinks that man is going to hurt him? I, I had to wonder, had this dog been abused by its master? Had somebody used a really rough hand with this dog? Man's best friend, but he remembered somebody mistreating him. He didn't cower for nothing. And so I ask you, who can forgive like God? Who can give you a new beginning like God? Who can love you in spite of all of your warts and all of your faults? Uh, who can be the companion? Who can be the guide? Who can be the one in your life that brings real meaning and purpose? long haul. And more than that, promise you something even better. Eternal life with him in heaven. A perfect place, the perfect body. Uh, yes, there's nothing like God. No wooden, no graven, uh, no images of any kind, nothing that we can make here on earth. And in spite of all of the wonderful Disney engineers, there's nothing they can create that would even become slightly like God. Your boat, your car, they're going to all slowly perish. 
and they're not going to forgive you because you didn't take care of them. And they're not going to forgive you and give you a start over again when you neglect them. But God will. God's a God of renewal. God's a God of forgiveness and grace and mercy. We need to think about that. Let's take a look at our next verses. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Now, Isaiah certainly has a certain amount of knowledge. Uh, after all, we, we are now uh, 600 years uh, uh, before Christ, and, and a lot of things have happened, and he's seen a lot of things. And certainly, scriptures are available, even though not like Bibles today. And it certainly spoke about how God spoke into existence the heavens and the earth. It certainly showed the history of God being able to deliver Daniel from the lion's den. It certainly showed all of the wonderful things that uh, uh, could have been and, and that had happened. Uh, but Isaiah only had a partial view. We have an entire scripture. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to be political, but I couldn't help but to watch in the debates last night uh, that uh, one of the political candidates said that if we don't do something soon with their environment uh, in just eight or ten years, uh, we, we won't even exist as a planet and as a people. Well, I think some other politician said that some 20 years ago and uh, we're still here. But I do know this. We certainly have a, bo a book that tells us that uh, there is going to be an end time. There's going to be a final judgment. And the signs of the times are everywhere that we may be fast approaching that. It may not be because of the environment. It may not be because of clean air, or clean water, or uh, some of the things that we can or can't do. God's in control of all of it. We need to never forget that. God is the one that controls the armies. God is the one that controls the air, the water. God is the one that either gives us a plentiful food or a fasting in a time of terrible drought, a time of expensive food or no food at all. God is the one that controls all of those things. We shouldn't be presumptuous and think that we know exactly when all of these things are going to happen. Nor should we be an alarmist to say that it's going to happen tomorrow. But it could. God could do, take and sound the trumpet. Everything's in place for that. Uh, we need to remember what the scripture says. He spoke it into existence. And he can also sound the trumpet to bring it to an end. You see, when I look at the book of Isaiah and I think about uh, the fact that Isaiah saw that God was in control of everything and there was nothing like him, that he had taken a little tiny piece of land in comparison with the entire world and he had placed a special people in that land and he made promises to them, conditional promises, which they broke eternal promises which he has kept and an eternal promise through the Messiah Jesus Christ that through him we can have eternal life in spite of what happens to this world oh it's a wonderful time to reflect and to recognize that by him all things are held together by him all things will come to an end and eternal life will be ours if we know Jesus is our Savior he spoke them into existence. He also will sound the trumpet to bring them to an end. And through his son, Jesus, he provides for us grace, mercy, love, and kindness. That through Jesus, we can have eternal life. We can be renewed daily now here on earth with our mortal physical bodies. But he can also renew us with new spiritual bodies. The renewal is a wonderful thing. Spiritual renewal is even more wonderful because here and now we can find a renewal available to us through him. So let's take a look what else Isaiah had to say. 
It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He, he, it is he who reduces the rulers to nothing, who make the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they began, have they planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble. How presumptuous are we? I, I recently watched a Netflix movie called Stephen Hawkins a man who was called brilliant. Well, I beg to differ. I don't think he was so brilliant after all. He may have been able to do mathematical calculations that would blow my mind away. He may have been able to create theories that were fascinating to other scientists, but he missed a living God. He failed to recognize that God created all of this, that he sits in heaven and he must laugh as we are so presumptuous that we can make America great again or that we could declare that America wouldn't exist in eight to ten years if we don't go to wind turbines and to uh, other devices of creating energy. How presumptuous are we that we would predict all of these things that are in his control? Oh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at the candidates and see what they stand for and what their values are and how they'll treat the American public and what kind of values they have for life. Uh, I'm not trying to be political at all with this. I just want you to know that we're very presumptuous when we think that we have things under our control, when in fact God has it all under control. He's the one. Uh, go back and compare our Genesis creation account and then go look at Revelation. After about chapter four or five, you'll find that judgment comes and this world is burned up. This world is destroyed. You'll find that God is in control. And how presumptuous could we be that we think we control it all? At least Isaiah saw that and he actually uttered these words that remind us about who's really in control. To whom then will you listen, me, that I would be as equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them by all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Who is his equal? No one is his equal. He created all of the heavens and the earth. We're still discovering stars and planets and thinking is a big thing, but I would give it a name. But God already knows all of the planets and all of the stars. And he says not one of them is missing, just as he created. Oh, so we are so, so caught up in ourselves that we think we are so smart. And yet no one is his equal. No one knows what he knows. No one has ever completed the things that he has done, and no one ever will, because he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and he controls all things, and by all things exists by him. So let's take a look at the next verse. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths may grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles, they will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. In recent days, I've been separated by death from several of my very good friends. In recent days, I've received emails and correspondence from dear friends who are suffering serious illness. Some of them have been declared as terminal. And yet I believe with all of my heart 
that God's grace is sufficient to see us all through whatever we must go through. But much more than that, I believe that Isaiah was absolutely correct, not only in forecasting the renewal of Israel and the land that God had promised them, but I believe that he also was speaking to us that one day, whether here on earth or whether later, we will be renewed. We'll mount up like with eagle's wings and we'll run and not be weary. I truly believe that. And I believe that Isaiah wrote these words not only for the nation of Israel, which would be renewed after terrible destruction. I believe he wrote it for us that we would not become despair. We would not become overly concerned about sickness or death, that we will be renewed. If not here on earth, as we make that transition from earth to heaven, we'll be renewed. We'll not be weary. Take a look at the scripture verse again as this video closes out. And be sure to attend your church, whether by video or whether in person, uh, you watch and continue to grow and apply God's word to your life. It's not just history and it's not just stories. It's events, events of history that prove that there is a living God and that one day we will mount up like eagle's wings and we'll run and not be weary. God bless you and have a great day. Mm -hmm.